Thank you uh, for the introduction and for inviting me to talk about my research today. So starting off, uh, just so that we're all on the same page, uh, the way our brain and nervous system functions uh, is com very heavily reliant on the actions of neurotransmitters, uh, both inhibitory neurotransmitters and excitatory neurotransmitters, and the balance between these two uh, within the nervous system. And these neurotransmitters are released from the presynaptic uh, nerve terminals and released into the synapse where they then bind at uh, the postsynaptic neuron uh, at ionotropic channel, ion channels or at metabotropic receptors. And these metabotropic receptors are G protein coupled receptors now, or GPCRs. GPCRs are seven pass transmembrane receptors and they couple to a heterotrimeric G protein, which is comprised of an obligate dimer of G beta gamma and a G alpha subunit that is uh, binds to guanine nucleotide. Now, upon ligand binding to the receptor, you have engagement of the G protein by the receptor, which stimulates the release of GDP and subsequent binding of GTP. This activates the G protein to cause functional dissociation so that the uh, obligate dimer G beta gamma and the G alpha subunit can then go act on their respective effector enzymes. And depending on which class of G protein you have, you can get a range of si different signals arising. We can categorize GPCRs based on their sequence and structural homology into different classes or families. The class A receptor, which is similar to the cartoon I just showed on the last slide, is one of the simpler receptors and most historically well studied. The class B receptors are peptide binding receptors. They can either bind exogenous uh, peptides or they can bind internal peptides, such as the adhesion GPCRs, which are also known for having long, um, large extracellular domains as well. There's also the class C and class F receptors. Uh, today, I'll be focusing mostly on the class C receptor, receptor family. And the class C receptors are um, characterized by being dimeric receptors, unlike the other classes of GPCRs. They're obligate dimers. They also have a very large extracellular domain. And this extracellular domain contains something called the venous flytrap domain, which is a clamshell-like domain which binds the ligand. Now, the other classes of GPCRs bind their ligands near the transmembrane domain, and class C receptor is different in that it's binding the ligand externally to the transmembrane region. Specifically, the two class C receptors that I'm going to be looking at today are primarily the GABB receptor, uh, which is uh, what my recent paper was on, and also I'll be bringing up and comparing it a little bit to the MGLUR5 um, structure. So the GABB receptor binds the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA. And when it binds GABA, it then activates uh, a GIO class of G protein, which inhibits adenylyl cyclase and also stimulates um, uh, potassium channels in order to, cut in, in order to allow for neuroinhibition. And the glutamate receptor binds the excitatory uh, neurotransmitter glutamate to stimulate GQ um, class of G proteins which activates PLC um, and downstream results in a increase in intracellular calcium and neuron excitability. Now, the pathways that these receptors go through is relatively well known, but what's less known is the actual mechani precise mechanistic details uh, at a molecular level of how ligand binding to a receptor causes the receptor to become activated, and how that changes protein-protein interactions between the receptor and the G protein and G protein effector enzymes. Um, and of course, in the Scoyotis lab, uh, we use our, our favorite technique, cryoelectron microscopy. And we've, uh, um, the lab has worked on a number of G protein coupled receptors, um, primarily of the class A family, um, some of the class B family, uh, bound to their respective G proteins, as well as class A receptors bound to beta arrestin, which is a protein involved in downregulation of GPCRs. And then recently, uh, last year, 
Uh, in collaboration with the Kabilka lab, our lab was able to determine the structure of a apostate and active state class C receptor of mGLUT5. Now, the mGLUT5 receptor, you can see between these two structures, we have this venous flytrap domain, and then we have a long linker region that contains a cysteine-rich domain and the transmembrane domains, the two protomers. Now, upon activation, there's actually, you have a closure of the venous flytrap domain, and this closure is in conformational changes then transduced to the transmembrane domains through the cysteine-rich linker region, uh, which is actually very important to transduce that signal for activation. Now, GABA-B is very unique among class C receptors in that it doesn't have the cysteine-rich domain. So how it's getting the signal transduced between the extracellular venous flytrap domain to the transmembrane region is unknown. Also unique with GABA-B is that we have a uh, heter uh, obligate heterodimer. So the MGLU5 structure um, and metabotropic many most metabotropic glutamate receptors are found as homodim hom homodimers. And even when they're in heterodimers, both subunits can bind ligand or can bind, have the ability to bind G protein. GABA B is unique in that the GABA B1 subunit binds the ligand, but the GABA B2 subunit doesn't bind ligand but act engages the G protein. The GABA B1 subunit cannot engage the G protein. So you have a necessary transactivation between the GABA B1 subunit and the GABA B2 subunit. Uh, that's very unique among GPCRs, but it also can tell us something about how possibly other class C GPCRs signal. Uh, by having this unique system. So uh, I suppose that's where my story begins. And I, West, uh, when I joined Skinny Otis Lab, I started by cloning and purifying GABA B. And to get the heterodimeric structure, I used tandem affinity purification. So there's actually two different tags on the GABA B1 and the GABA B2 receptor. So I knew that I would get, be able to get the heterodimer. And I was able to uh, determine, we were able to determine a structure from that. Here you can see in teal, the GABA B1 receptor and in tan, the GABA B2 receptor. And the inverse agonist is bound in the venous flytrap domain, uh, this in gold here. And we noticed some very interesting things from the structure. Uh, the first thing that stood out is this extracellular loop. So, of course, GABA B doesn't have this cysteine rich domain, but the way it compensates for that is actually through this long extracellular loop 2, which, along with the linker, forms a beta sheet in both GABA B1 and GABA B2. And I don't have, didn't have time to show uh, our functional assays for this, um, but we did uh, look at shortening, truncating the length of that linker, and this is indeed a very important point. Uh, for transducing the signal from the VFT to the 7TMs in this receptor. Uh, additionally, we noticed a difference between our mGLU5 stru GLU structure and the GABA-B structure in that in the inactive state, the transmembrane domains of each protomer are actually much closer together in GABA-B. In fact, they actually make an interaction on the cytosolic side of the receptor in which we have histidine and glutamate residues that are forming a, a ionic lock. And if we mutate these residues to alanine, we actually have an increase in constitutive activity of the receptor, suggesting that it's actually an auto-inhibitory lock while this receptor is in an active state. And the most surprising thing that we found um, was actually that there was a phospholipid bound in the center, in the core, of each transmembrane domain. <laughs> And one of, in this, with this phospholipid, one of the phospholipid tails is um, buried into the receptor, while the other phospholipid tail is actually coming out through TM5 and TM6. You can see in this cutaway of the uh, EM map. Based on the environment of the, um, the residue environment surrounding the head group of the phospholipid, as well as the known um, lipids found in insect cells, which was a purification system, uh, 
we determined and based on our the fit into the map we determined that we thought our most likely candidate for the phospholipid would be uh, phospholipomolamine, um, which we fit into the map. And we also did some mutational uh, functional assays um, showing that there's an interaction with this arginine group here uh, with the uh, phospholipid head group. And so this phospholipid is actually coordinated into this spot um, by residues on the ECL2 loop as well as um, some TM residues, cancer residues. It also is important for the structural integrity of the receptor. Uh, we found through doing molecular dynamic simulations. So if, when we run simulations, we remove the lipid from the receptor. We actually see a very quick collapse of the receptor uh, transmembrane domains. And, but if we measure the transmembrane cavity volume, uh, we see about a 30% decrease in cavity volume when we remove that lipid. Um, over time. So I had mentioned before that I'm using a tandem affinity purification method to get the um, heterodimeric structure, but if you don't use a tandem affinity purification method, you actually get a proportion of your receptors that are homodimeric. And so we were also able to determine a structure of a GABA B1 homodimer. Now, these homodimers are not capable of signaling through GABA B or cannot capable of signaling through G protein because GABA B2 is required for the G protein um, activation. However, there are some a number of cell types that actually express GABA B1 without GABA B2, and it's still unclear what this receptor is doing without having its G protein binding partner. Um, and beyond the possible physiological relevance of this, we found some really interesting structural aspects of this receptor um, that we found intriguing. And for one, if we look at the venous flytrap domain, so if we look at the heterodimer, uh, in the inactive state, you can see that the lower lobes of the receptor are apart. And then when it becomes activated, you can see that the lower lobes close in on each other. If we overlay this with our homodimer structure, black here, you can see it much more closely resembles the, the active state of the, um, the activated state of the venous flytrap domains. Not only that, if we look at the transmembrane domains, in our heterodimer, we have this TM5, TM5 interface. In the homodimer, we end up changing the interface to a TM6, TM6 interface. Not only that, but this interface is actually the same interface that we would see that we see in our MGLU5 structure, where we have a TM6, TM6 interface. You can say they're overlaid, you know, quite similarly. And the overall morphology of the receptor actually looks also like the activated MGLU5 structure, in which we have this kind of twisting of the receptor. Uh, so we think this is an active-like confirmation, and in fact, there have been some chimera studies in which if you take and swap out one of these transmembrane domains for GABA-B2, you actually get a constitutionally active receptor that doesn't even need an agonist to be added in order to be active. Um, so this is in an active-like state, even though it can't couple to G-protein. So in summary, uh, I've told you a few key things about the structures that we've been able to determine uh, of GABA-B. Uh, with the GABA-B heterodimer, uh, we have this, we found this extended extracellular loop 2 that's able to compensate um, in con conjunction with the linker as well to make this beta sheet formation and compensate for not having a cysteine-rich domain. We have this really surprising uh, phospho, these phospholipids that are found in the core of the receptor. And we have an autoinhibitory lock in between the two receptors uh, in the inactive state. And we also determine this homodimeric structure that seems to be in an active light confirmation, uh, even though it can't signal through G protein. Um, and it may give us some clues. At the time, we were thinking it could give us some clues in the possible activation of the receptor in absence of activated states. But now there's a few other papers that have come out right around the same time as ours um, that also include the active state of the receptor. And it seems to be that it is very similar to the active state um, of GABA-B.
So with that, I would like to um, acknowledge some people. Uh, first, Yergo Skiniotis um, for being an excellent mentor. Uh, Mike Robertson uh, did the modeling of GABA B as well as the molecular dynamics work. Uliana uh, Panova and Alpay7 uh, both helped me and assisted in collecting cryo EM data. Um, Chen Wei was um, very helpful in first training me in how to do um, freezing grids and processing my data. Jesper Matheson, unfortunately, I didn't have time to share a lot of his functional assays that supported the, our findings through that we found with the structure, cryo structures. Um, NIH for funding, Stanford, BioX for housing us at Stanford. And if you want to follow the lab or myself on Twitter, here are Twitter handles. And with that, I'll take any questions. Great, thank you. That was a really interesting talk. So our first question is from uh, Wei Huang. So I'm just going to unmute them. Okay. Hi, Mark here. It's a very nice talk. Uh, so my question is, uh, what are the biological insights for those lipids by to the transmembrane uh, domain of you uh, membrane protein? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. That's my favorite topic is the lipids, actually. <laughs> Um, so as far as physiological function, so we did do some functional assays where we mutated um, the residues that we thought would be interacting, such as um, that arginine residue. And we actually, um, we had some interesting data. In fact, I think I have an extra slide of it, possibly, probably. So in the paper, we showed two of the different types of mutations we did. So one was excluding the lipid tails from the receptor. So there's actually, if you mutate the, the transmembrane residues to a tryptophan, you sterically, you would sterically, we believed it would sterically occlude the, um, the lipid. And when we did that, we actually had an increase in um, the efficacy of the receptor. Um, and when we change, when we mutate is the arginine residues that coordinate the head group, we actually had a slightly different effect. Um, we still had increased efficacy, but we also had an increase in potency. Now, I don't know precisely why that is, but it, because we have that coordination between the ECL2 loop um, of the phospholipid head group, it's possible it's kind of like a sensor of some sort between the VFT and the 7TM. That's my best guess. It's, it certainly is something that should be explored more though. Does that answer your question? They're muted again, so but that was a that sounds good. Yes, that they have said yes and answered their question. I had a quick question regarding the density that you showed actually. So it looked like um, the density connecting the soluble domain and the TM was quite weak in places. Uh, I wonder if you did anything like uh, multi-body refinement or any kind of flexibility analysis. Uh, which maybe would account for any mobility or between those two domains? So I did a little bit of multi-body analysis. Um, I did not see, well, I should say, I saw two things. Um, there was some movement, but I couldn't say whether or not it made any sense. So. <laughs> In one respect, I saw the heads kind of moving like this in respect to the TMs. And then there was another one where it was kind of like this. Um, I don't, didn't quite know how I could interpret that in a way that I could say confidently what I thought was happening. <laughs> But they, we definitely see that the weakest part of the map, the hardest part to, mo or to um, the hardest part of the map to get was actually this linker region. Um, so there clearly is uh, some flexibility there. How it's, what direction it's flexible in, I don't know that I could comment on that. And I think the, mostly the part that was flexible too is here, so the, the least stabilized portion, so there's a loop here, 
And we've seen that like if you went out um, to a different threshold on this, you'll see the loop kind of comes out here. It's not really interacting with the receptor. So, I mean, this is, there's a single, you know, string of peptides here between these two. Okay, yeah, that, that mirrors my experience with multibody approaches. Uh, and they can be quite difficult to interpret. Um, just a unrelated question to that. Given the lipid that you see bound, do you think there's any chance that there may be detergent effects at play? So if you try this uh, complex solubilizer in a different manner, particularly say a nano disc or a smalp or something, maybe you would see different lipid occupancies or lipid types? So that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, we actually, we think the lipid is resonant there before, well, it must be resonant there actually before the purification process, you know, the extraction from the membrane. So the, we're using, my detergent has cholesterol and um, a GDN was the detergent that was used in this. And the, uh, the lipid must be coming from the membrane of the uh, insect cells. Um, also, there's another paper, it was a, if, a nice paper actually in the same issue of Nature that came out with ours from the um, Clark, Frank, and Fan lab um, on GABA B. And they also uh, saw the phospholipids and they were able to do mass spec analysis on it. And they got that it was 50% occupancy by um, phosphoethanolamine and 50% by phosphatidylcholine. Um, and given that they have a similar result to us, I would think that it probably has a preference for phosphoethanolamine and phosphatidylcholine. Um, oh, and it, it also makes sense that the, the I, I think that if there was another lipid that could fit into that location, it probably wouldn't have the right, um, the right residues uh, to bind the head group, or not right residues, the right head group in order to coordinate with the residues, it probably could go there if it was in some type of artificial system. Um, but since it's already in there by the time you're t extracting it from the membrane, I don't know that we would necessarily see a difference. Okay. So related to that, we've just got a question from Lindsay Clark. She can't use her microphone, so I'll just read it out. Um, do you see any resolved cholesterol or CHS given that you've added it to your detergent mix? Uh, yes, we do, um, actually. So there were, we see uh, some elongated um, densities in our map. Um, that were uh, structured compared to the rest of the um, my cell. Uh, and we believe that these are, we didn't make a claim to which these were um, because both GDN and CHS have these multi-membered ring structures. Um, so we believe they're either GDN or CHS that are stabilized uh, in between these two. Oh, that's cool. So they're right in the interface. Do you see that in the homodimer as well as the heterodimer? Uh, we see some. It's not quite, the, there isn't as much space in between the two, but you see them more a little bit on the periphery between the two. Okay. Was the homodimer- But they're not packed in there quite like this. Yeah. Was the homodimer C2 symmetric or was it still asymmetric? It's a little bit asymmetric. We actually, we were able to get a better map um, using C1 symmetry okay. rather than C2. Did you try uh, expanding the C2 symmetry out and treating it as essentially as twice as many monomers? Expanding the C2 symmetry out. I don't think so because I don't quite understand what you mean by that. So. Okay, oh, yeah. so the technique, the technique called, called symmetry expansion, where if you have something which is almost but not quite C2, you effectively take it along the C2 axis and double up your particle number, but only look at one half at a time. Oh, interesting. I'll have to, I'll have to look at that. 
So you essentially get the particle number boost from the symmetry, but you can allow some small changes if you have not quite true symmetry. Hmm. No, I didn't try that. So I'm going to open up the microphone now so anyone can unmute themselves if they have questions. So right now, if anyone has any questions, just feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. And if not, I'd just like to thank you again for a really interesting talk. Thanks for having me. It was, it was fun to be able to talk about my work. No, it was interesting. I, I like all of this lipid stuff. <laughs>